What is going on YouTube? Lamont at large. Today, as a helicopter soars over my head, just as I hit the record button, we're still gonna press through. Yeah! Helicopters, I'll never ever ride one ever in my life. Any kind of contraption that is powered by a form of sorcery where something spins around really fast and it flies, Hey, kids, not doing it. When it comes to that, I live in the 17th century. Moving along from my fear of helicopters, the reason why I'm here today at the Ohio State University is because, well, I'm here to talk about a former employee of this great university, and that man's name was James Howard Snook, a uh, very well-accomplished man. Uh, he was held with very high regard here at this the Ohio State University he was a man he was a professor he was an inventor and he was a murderer let's begin with the story so this man James Howard Snook was born September 17th 1879 what's Mr. Snook's claim to fame who is he what did he do? Well, he did quite a few things, but he's famous for three things. He's famous for being a gold medal winner at the 1920 Olympics in Antwerp, Belgium. Uh, he won a gold medal with the United States men's pistol team. Uh, he won uh, in the uh, 30 meter target event, 1920. Go USA, go. He's also an inventor of a device that is used to spade animals. It's called the Snook Hook. Yeah. Always have your pets spaded and neutered. And do not buy from those puppy mill people. I can't stand those people when they post online. Got all these dogs being put down. And anyways, get away from that. So he invented that. And he's also of course, famous for murdering his 24-year-old lover, Deora Hicks. So let's try to go to the story. So this guy was the professor of veterinary sciences here at the, uh, the Ohio State University. And at the time he was married, his wife was a little bit younger than him, and they had a kid together, right? They lived in a suburban home in the Columbus, Ohio area. Everything was going great. Everything is going fine. And then one day he meets 21-year-old Theora Hicks. And, you know, uh, they start talking. She says, hey, can I get a ride home? He says, sure you can. Sure you can. So I guess that ride went really well because uh, after that, they had sex. I said that a little bit too loudly. She looked up when I said that word. Sex! Just thought I'd say that again. Now she's blushing. Well, so after a couple weeks of giving her rides home, they had S-E-X. I always thought the third time was a charm on that one. And what turned into a fling uh, ended up being like a three-year love affair between Diora and James. So this is basically what they would do. Um, you know, this guy's cheating on his wife. Obviously, he has a really good job career, if you will. He doesn't want to get caught. And so what they would do is um, they would go to like seedy motels or hotels, or sometimes they would just go ahead and bang it out in the car, right? Uh that wasn't always um, a, a good place to do it, though, because uh, James had a smaller car. Right? I said car. So, you know, three years of them doing this, doing that. And during the course of their affair, they started experimenting with ooh, uh, what we, today what we call drugs. But back in those days, it wasn't really called drugs that I know of. I, I, I don't I'm not sure. Maybe maybe uh, weird pharma pharmaceuticals. Is that what they called it? Who knows? Maybe they did call it drugs anyways. 
So because James was a professor at the, at the veterinary lab here at The Ohio State University, wow, those helicopters really love this flight path, right? All right. So because he was, a, uh, you know, a professor at the lab, he had access to all kinds of cool drugs, right? So they would often experiment with a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of reefer, a little bit of good times, but nothing was always perfect, right? Because, you know, Theora, she loved it. She was a party girl. She's a college student, a broke college student. She once confessed, or several times she confessed to her roommates that she, you know, she was just a broke, struggling college girl. You know what I mean? And... But she loved to party. You know, she liked to partake, partake in the finer aspects of uh, drug use. But nothing wrong with that. You know, a little bit of reefer, no problem, right? And one day, she tells, um, she tells James, she's like, hey, listen, Snooky, Snooky's cookies. Um, you know, because, you know, Theora was, you know, she had other boyfriends. I mean, dude, a 23 year old college. You know, girl is not going to just be dating some, you know, 45, 50 year old man without having some side action. So one time they were talking about SEX and she says, you know, I don't know how to say this to you, but she says, you know, there's this book. It's called the Karma Sutra. And basically it kind of shows or teaches guys about the finer aspects of certain parts of a woman's body and how to access these areas and how to fulfill a woman's, you know, thing, whatever you wanna call it, huh? So uh, I, a lot of guys would actually take that uh, as a, you know, being offensive. Like if, if some woman did that to me, personally, I would read the book. <laughs> Maybe I might learn something. There's nothing wrong with reading. But a lot of guys, they would take offense to that. And maybe James was secretly pissed off at her. Maybe he found out through uh, this person, that person, that uh, she she had a Chad, as, as the kids today is called, a Chad. You know, a a, a, a well built younger Chad guy who who hammers it down in the bedroom. <laughs> you know, one of those guys, right? So one day, the aura somebody had broken into her. Uh, her room and the dorms here on campus. She lived in one of these dorms at the time and it scared her half to death. So James got her a little Derringer pistol to carry with her just, you know, so she could feel safe. And oftentimes, uh, you know, to show her how to shoot the gun, because remember this guy was an Olympic gold medalist at the, uh, you know, at the, at the pistol shooting thing. So this guy likes guns. So they would often go to the, um, uh, this shooting, this gun shooting range, I think it was called the New York Club or something like that. I should have really remembered what the name of this place was. But they would often go there to, uh, you know, to shoot guns or whatever. To shoot those guns. So later on into their love affair, I guess they got tired of the CD motels and James's, you know, small car. I said car. So later on, uh, they ended up renting a kind of like a boarding room, which is basically, it could be any, it's basically a room in somebody's house. They have those, you know, those old bigger houses and it's like divided up into like maybe 10 rooms. So they rented this room from this lady. I think her last name was Mrs. Smalley. So James told the landlady, you know, that basically that, you know, James rented this place so they could have a place to go to instead of having to, you know, keep on going to hotels and motels. And so he kept this place and he tells the landlady, hey, I'm a traveling salesman. I sell salt. Yeah, really, really ingenious to make up a occupation. So he's a salt salesman. He tells this lady, hey, my uh, my wife, this is Mrs. Snook. I'm Mr. Snook. I'm a salt salesman but I do a lot of traveling. So whenever I'm out of town, please keep an eye on my wife. She's young, she's wet behind the ears. She doesn't know a whole lot, you know what I'm saying? I mean, look at her, she, she, she's, a, she's a kid for God's sake. But luckily, I guess for Miss, Mrs. Smalley that she never really had to do that because 
she never seen one of them without the other. If James was there, so was Theora. Theora there, James as well, so forth and so on. So they rented this place for, you know, whatever amount of time. And, you know, life continued. The uh, sex was, I guess, good for at least one of them. Maybe both of them. I don't know. Maybe Theora really liked James. He was just a nice guy. Who knows? I mean, seriously, who, who really knows? Unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, as they say. So we're going to fast forward to June 16th, 1929. So it's the early morning hours, maybe 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. Two teenage boys, they go to the New York Central shooting range over off of McKinley Avenue and Fisher Road. They're going to go there to hone their shooting skills. And they go to the rifle range, and one of the kids notices that there's somebody laying in the grass over yonder. So they go up to the body, because they probably just think it's somebody, some homeless person. But it was not a homeless person. It was a woman, and beneath her, seeping around her body, seeping into the grass was a lot of blood so these kids they hightail it to whoever has a phone or the police station another article says where they told the police there's somebody and we think they're dead there's blood all over the place so the cops come now it's about 7 30 8 o'clock in the morning and we have a crime scene and just by looking at the body, they can tell that this woman has absolutely been beaten with what they're going to guess is some kind of a hammer. Uh, parts of her skull are crushed and she has this gaping wound in her neck. Somebody beat this poor woman to death and they just slit her throat. Looks like we have a murder. Now, at that same time, Theora's roommates, she hadn't came back from last night. And normally, there would be times where, you know, she would go out with either her boyfriend, if you can call him that, James Howard Snook, or she had another boyfriend uh, by the name of Marion. But they already had broken up at this time. So they were kind of worried about her and they called the police to put out a missing persons report and either the police told them about a body that had been discovered or they seen it in the newspaper that a body was discovered but anyways they were alerted that there was a, a body of a young white female that was found uh, not too far from the Ohio State University. So they go to the morgue to identify the girl that's there being Theora, and they did make a positive ID on that poor girl. So immediately the police, they pulled him into the uh, interview room and they said, okay, talk to us. Uh, is there anybody that you know that could have possibly done this? Now, immediately in murder cases such as this, uh, from what they could see, possibly could be a crime of passion or you just have a murdering rapist roaming around the Columbus area. And this could be the start of somebody just being a scumbag serial killer. So they said, well, her boyfriend, Marion, but like he, we don't think he's the type of guy to do stuff like that. And they had already broken up for quite some time. So they get uh, the address of this Marion guy and they talk to him. And he, of course, said, I didn't do that. Not at all. He gave them an alibi of where he where he was uh, at at the time of her murder, because the coroner, he estimated that she had been dead for about 12 to 14 hours. So he placed the time of her death, uh, maybe maybe the early evening of June 15th. So 
he says, yeah, we broke up about a year ago and I'm engaged. I would, you know, I'm very saddened to hear that that happened to Theora, but I would have never done anything of that nature. Okay. So they start prying around, you know, family, friends. They go to the school. They start interviewing people at the school and come to find out uh, there was a man whose name kind of came up as a person that uh, Theora used to work for as a stenographer for the uh, department that he worked at at the Ohio State University, James Howard Snook. So they go into the university to go and talk to him. The police, they go down to the Ohio State University. They go looking to talk to Mr. Snook. They go to his office and they're like, hey, uh, what's going on? How are we doing? Uh, we're investigating the death of uh, a young girl by the name of Theora Hicks. And he says, yeah, oh my God, that's so sad. It's been all over the newspapers and it's been spreading all over the school. It's quite sad to hear about such a young, vibrant woman uh, being uh, found dead like that. So... You know, mind you, the police now, they already know that there have been rumors going around the school in that department that uh, Theora and Snook were having an affair. Now, it's just one of those things like where you, you know, really know work at your job and you know that so-and-so is uh, messing around. So they said, hey, would you mind coming with us down to the station so we could interview you? At first, he's a little bit apprehensive, you know, because... Nobody wants to be involved in a in a murder or, or, you know, even have anything to do with it. But to help the investigation, of course, he's going to go down there. So he goes down to the police department. He goes down, goes into the interview room and they sit down and they talk. So they say, OK, where were you the night of June 15th? What were you doing? He says, I was at my lab. I was doing paperwork. And then after I left, I went down to the Scioto Country Club. I think that's how you pronounce it, Scioto or Scioto. And I had forgot something there. And then I went back home and they're saying, okay, well, what time did you leave the lab? He said, uh, I don't know, seven o'clock, 7.30. They're like, okay, uh, what time did you get home? He goes, I don't know, nine, 10. He goes, I don't know. I don't look at my watch all the time. And they're like, okay, okay. Now, they have a funny feeling about this guy because they know that he's been messing around with this girl for the better part of three years. So they interview the wife, right? So this is what they did. They asked him if they could uh, go down to, well, actually, you know what? I don't know if they did ask him because back in those days, I don't even know if there was such thing as a search warrant. But what they did is when he told them about him having, you know, uh, a membership at the country club, they go down there and they search his locker. <laughs> when they open up his locker, they find like, I guess what you would call narcotics. They like, like weird powders and pills and all kinds of nonsense. What they knew then was drugs. So they find a bunch of drugs in his locker. So something's not adding up, adding up. And so they ask to go to his house. So that they go to talk to his wife. So the wife, they ask her like, hey, where was your husband at on the night of June 15th? She says, well, I was in bed. It's about, I don't know, about 7 o'clock, 7.30. Now, mind you, she's in bed because she just got pregnant, which is kind of funny because the story kind of takes a wild curve, no pun intended, if you will. And so she said, I was in bed around 7 o'clock, 7.30. I hear the door slam downstairs, but I, I'm not feeling too well, so I'm, I just stay in bed. I'm reading a book. A couple hours later, I'm just kind of wondering what, you know, what's going on. So I just go downstairs. Maybe it's around 9 o'clock, 9.30. And uh, I, see, uh, I see my husband downstairs uh, doing whatever, reading a newspaper or smoking a cigar. Who knows? So they're checking around the house and they see, they see his car parked, right? And mind you, he, he just got his car, I guess what you would call then clean, but detailed, right? And I don't know why or how they found this out. But they found out that uh, he had taken... Uh, a, a suit of his to the cleaners. I don't know if though, I don't know if they asked the wife, Hey, did your, did your husband, did you like wash any of his clothes? Maybe that was it. Maybe they asked her, did you handle any of like laundry? Maybe he's trying to clean some blood off. 
So they find out that he had this blue suit that was at the dry cleaners. So they go to the cleaners and they ask for the suit. They get the suit. While doing that, they're looking at the car and they find a little bit of blood on the suit that he took to the cleaners. They find some blood in the door jam of the car. So obviously he didn't do that good of a job with detailing his car. And then on top of that, now this one, eh, I don't know how much uh, uh, evidence or how good of evidence this was, but they found a ball peen hammer and a uh, small pocket knife, which they believe, uh, even though they were clean, it looked like someone cleaned it. So I'm not sure if there was really any blood per se on those items, but uh, on the folding knife, they looked to be some kind of stain. They're not, I don't know if they were sure if it was rust or blood, but uh, in theory, quote, air quotes, they found the murder weapon. So they have all this evidence and they take Snook back to the uh, police department and then they take him to jail. Now, he's not admitting anything yet, right? He's not admitting anything. He's denying it, denying it, denying it. You know, they're looking at this nerd and they're saying, we know you did it. We know that you killed her. They're probably doing the good cop, bad cop. I think it stopped raining. We could take this. We could put this down. Anyways. So at the time, Snook hired these two lawyers, right? Because, you know, this guy, he makes a good living. So it's best to hire a lawyer. Now, back in those times, unlike these times, when you hired a lawyer, they would not necessarily take a case a lot not every lawyer but some of them they wouldn't it's not like they were taking any case that came across their table i mean there were cd lawyers right there was other lawyers in the other parts of town that would take anybody's case they don't care they don't, they don't take anybody's money but these two guys they weren't gonna take that man's case unless they knew going into trial that he was innocent so they could have filed a habeas corpus, which is um, some kind of legal terminology, um, asking for his release or at least asking for some kind of uh, bail in the case. That way he can fight, fight it from the outside because it always looks better when you're fighting whatever charge you're being charged with from the outside. But they didn't file for that because they just wanted to have him, believe it or not, this is so weird, they wanted to have him sit in jail <laughs> And just, they, they were like, let's just see what he ha what happens. Let's not file the paperwork trying to get him to get out of jail. Let's have him sit and wait to make sure that he is absolutely innocent like he claims. So this guy's sitting in jail for a week. He's sweating bullets. He's nervous. He's scared. And finally, like an egg, he cracks. And... He calls into one of the uh, the jailers. Hey, I want to talk to the detectives. Oh, what do you want to talk about there, Snooko? Snookos, whatever you want to call him. He said, uh, he said, I killed her. I killed her. Well, of course you killed her. We already told you you killed her, you nerd. But why'd you kill her? Um, this part's kind of weird. Okay, tell us what happened. And he says, well, that's easy. This was simply a case of self-defense. Self-defense? Oh, well, what do you mean? What happened? What do you mean self-defense? He goes, well, on the night of the 15th, me and Theora, we were hanging out doing all kinds of cool drugs that I acquired from my lab. By the way, he was promptly fired from the Ohio State University once they found uh, the drugs in his locker room at his country club and he also found a little bit of party favors at work the disgraced professor snook no more no longer a professor so he said you know we're doing party favors uh theora liked to smoke weed or as they like to call it back in those days reefer so for some unknown reason they didn't go to the um the boarding house where they had that little place to go hang out. I don't know why. 
So they're at the country club and they start like making out, right? And they're in his car. And he said like, Diora wanted to go to a to a uh, uh, like like a motel or a hotel. Maybe she didn't want to go to the boarding house for some unknown reason. I don't know why. So they start fooling around in the car, and it's uncomfortable because his car is it's kind of small, right? There wasn't a lot of leg room, I guess. So he tells the detectives that Diora told him, "quote." Let's go somewhere because I want to scream, if you know what I mean. So, one thing leads next to another. So, they go to the New York Central shooting range. Why? I don't know. Maybe they just want to bang it out in their car over there. I don't know. So, they go over there. And they're in the car. They're just talking right now, right? Because maybe they just got done doing it or whatever. I don't know. But anyways, so James tells Theora, he's like, hey, look, and this is a, this is his story. He says, hey, look, uh, I'm going with my family on a vacation. We're going to be gone out of, of town for three weeks. And supposedly all of a sudden in some reefer induced uh, temporary insanity slash madness, all of a sudden, Theora just starts yelling and screaming at him and, 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 and cussing at him. And then she starts hitting him in the face, like with her balled up fist for some unknown reason. And it was no like, Theora wasn't a little woman. She was, uh, I mean, she was a, a good sized woman, not in that way, but she wasn't little. She, she made it known that, uh, you know, she was not the one to be messed with and, you know, she could handle her own. So she wasn't like a dainty little woman. So whatever happened, I know damn well she went down with a fight. So she supposedly, according to uh, James, starts attacking him. And like he's covering up. He's like, what the heck? And then she starts reaching in her purse for that Derringer he bought her from that time that she had a break in at her dorm room. So he, he's, she's about to kill him. So he reaches in the back seat because he had a hammer. He grabs it and he smacks her upside the head with it a few times. And then she she stops. Well, is she dead now? Uh, no, no, no. She's not dead now. No. Okay. Uh, oh, what, what happened next? He's like, well, uh, she was suffering. Okay. She was suffering. Did you call the police? Did you call the paramedics or whatever emergency medical system that was going around at the time? I'm sure they had paramedics then. He said, uh... He said, no, I took my knife and I slit her throat to end her suffering. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's that's what you do. When you get into a fight with your lover, you definitely bash her brains in with a ball peen hammer and then slit her throat just to end her suffering. So as you can see, uh, the uh, police, they weren't buying this nonsense. And uh, the attorneys for Snook, they heard this and they're like, well... I told you we should have, uh, uh, we were right. We should have, you know, waited. So now he's booked on the charge of uh, first degree murder. Now, his attorneys immediately say, okay, look, he confessed. We don't really have much of a case. We're, tr we're going to try to get him on, uh, get him off due to a temporary insanity plea, right? So they're going for that. Now, this case was very sensationalized in the newspapers because back in those days, you couldn't really write certain things, right? You couldn't really write things in a sexual nature. You could, but you had to dance your way around them, right? Had to dance your way around them. But the sordid details of this murder and what they did, I mean, and they were asking pretty personal questions. So the affair comes out, Mrs. Snook, the wife, uh, has to hear all this nonsense while they're in court. She's embarrassed. And basically, all the weird details come out. Here's a, here's a weird detail that came out during the case. Earlier I said how uh, Mrs. Snook was in bed, pregnant. Well, that's a shocker because, well, James Howard Snook, he gave himself a vasectomy. Yeah, 
Yeah, he gave himself a vasectomy because he didn't want any more kids. You know, because he's banging around with uh, Theora. He doesn't, he doesn't want to knock her up. He doesn't want to get her pregnant. So he, he decides to, uh, to do that, and it looks like he failed. All right, okay. So another sordid detail that came out in the case, and hey, the prosecutor at the time, he's asking the Snook character, he's like, why did you cheat on your lovely wife? You know, his wife was quite a bit younger than, uh, than uh, James Snook. And he says, why'd you cheat on her? And, you know, there's a lot of people in the courtroom. This is embarrassing. But he says, basically he said, you know, I had needs as a man. I had needs as a man and my wife wasn't meeting those demands. And the prosecutor, maybe he's a... You know, maybe he's hearing some good stories. <laughs> maybe he ain't getting any action either in, in, the, uh, in his life, so maybe he's trying to figure something out so he can learn something from this guy. Who knows? But he asked this guy, okay, so he's like, well, what do you mean? Like, you're, you mean your wife's preggers, right? Obviously, you guys are having sex. What was Theora doing that your wife wasn't doing? And, of course, uh, Mr. Snook, nervously, he's looking around the courtroom and everybody is just like, they're just like, they, they just, they just can't, they can't get enough of this. This is like, no one hears about sex. I mean, for God's sakes, it's the 1920s. You know what I mean? Moving along. So he said, well, there's a certain thing that, Theora liked to do that my wife wasn't really fond of. She wasn't, she wasn't into it. And he said, well, what, what kind of thing? What, what, are we, what are we talking about over here? Now, this prosecutor is getting awfully excited right now. And she said, he says, well, I don't know. I, listen, I'll say this, guys. I don't know if I can repeat the word on this channel. This is a PG-13 channel and will remain so. But I will say that the, the, the thing that Theora liked to do that his wife didn't like to do, I'm going to say it rhymes with Horatio. Okay? You guys are going to have to figure out for yourself what I'm talking about. I think... I think we got some smart kids in this channel subscribed. Thank you for subscribing. I think we all know what we're talking about. And let me just say this. I've been saying this for years. Ladies out there, we can learn something from this. I'm not trying to be sexist and I'm not trying to be a creep. I have a saying though. The saying is, if you won't, she will. Always, always remember that. If you won't, she will. Unfortunately, that's got to be in the back of your head. Moving along. So everybody is aghast. Oh, and also other sort of details came out like, you know, Theora's, uh, you know, drug use, his drug use, uh, their sexual appetite. Uh, they would have sex everywhere, all over the city. In the car, she would, you know, throw down on him wherever. This was a party girl. You know what I mean? She liked to have fun. She liked this guy. But she, she also had other boyfriends, like the Marion guy. You know? So, you know, she, she liked to, you know, she liked to go out. And also, uh, when they were doing an investigation at her house, remember when I told you earlier how Theora would say that she's just a poor college girl? Well, there was probably a reason why she was hanging out with Snook so much because they found quite a bit of money uh, in her bank account. She had three different bank accounts and a safety deposit box, which I, I believe they found a little bit of a uh, little bit of drugs in there. But uh, she had about, I want to say over $5,000 all together, which, you know, that's quite a bit of money. Uh, I, I think that would be, uh, well... So, uh, at least over fifty thousand dollars, and this is supposedly a 
a starving college student, right? So they're just enamored with the with this sordid sex case thing, right? They can't believe it. This is just this is awesome. So the trial goes on a little while longer, and well, I'm at a cemetery, so you guys know what's going on. You guys know what 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 time it is, and well, it was time for the verdict, and the verdict, the jury didn't even take. Mm, I don't even think they took uh, 30 minutes, and they found him guilty, and uh, he was sentenced to die uh, via the electric chair. Now, you know, by the time the uh, verdict came in, because mind you, uh, Snook's mother and wife were at the court every, every day of the trial. When the verdict came out, the newspapers were like, you know, they were like looking around the reporters to take pictures of the uh, of Snook's wife, but they were already gone because they got the verdict from the uh, from the judge before it was announced. So they left the courtroom. So there was no there was no um, final uh, you know comment from the mother or the wife. So this guy, he is now you know. Ohio's newest death row inmate and he moved to a nice new prison cell on death row. Let's fast forward to execution day, February 28, 1930. Now, Snook, he had requested that during his final dinner with his family, if he could wear a tuxedo. Uh, the, the prison warden said, no, 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 no tuxedo for you. He said, oh, okay. So he had to wear his drab gray prison issued outfit. So he had a final meal with his wife, a friend of his, the wife's cousin, and his mom. And after that, they left. He changed into a business suit. I'm not sure if it's the same one that he wore when he murdered Deora Hicks. And... With the uh, wet, red, teary eyes from what uh, some newspaper reporters who witnessed the execution said that it looked like he had been crying considerably as he was finally led on the final walk to have a seat and the hot seat, which is the, the old electric chair. They flipped the switch and about seven minutes or so later, uh, he was pronounced dead. And uh, his grave was a very secret, like, thing for a long time. It was, in fact, so secret that when they buried him, they did not bury him with his last name of Snook, but simply his first and his middle name. Of course, this is the grave of James Howard Snook. And uh, this cemetery is absolutely massive. I definitely do want to come back out here and vlog the whole grounds. This place is actually so big, it has its own police department. There's actually a cop car that comes around and says Green Lawn Police. So, yeah, he gave me a, he gave me an up and down, but he kept it pushing. He knew I was a good guy. He knows I'm a good guy. Anyways, payable on death. You know, who knows what the true reason of why he killed her. Remember what I said earlier in the video, guys? Remember when I was saying that she maybe in a sense kind of belittled him, talking about how he wasn't really performing in bed as good as her boyfriend? Maybe she says something like that to him and he just went off the wall. He just went ape nuts. That's what I call it, ape nuts. This guy went ape crazy and just beat her to death. So who knows? But I imagine all these people buried next to him heard about this case. And I wonder if they know who they were being buried next to. Who knows? Anyways, guys, I'm out of here. This was a long and sordid video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did telling the story itself. And if you are in the Columbus area or you're passing through, hey, if you like cemeteries and you can only pick one, 
choose this one. Lots of history, lots of old graves. Um, so far in Ohio, this is my favorite cemetery. So anyways, live but not live, but still alive by the grace of God. I am Lamont at large. Thank you for watching. I always appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day, evening, wherever you are. Stay safe. I'll catch up with you on the next vlog. Peace out.